I want to introduce to you Jason Kovacs. Jason, uh, his family live in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, Jason grew up in Vancouver or in that general area. Uh, he's also been in Charlotte, North Carolina. He was at uh, RTS there studying. He's also been uh, in a number of other places, uh, most recently in Austin, Texas, and worked with a large church there, Austin Stone, and began a counseling ministry there in that church for nine years before, uh, in the last nine months, relocating back to his home in uh, Vancouver, <clears throat> where he is engaged right now in a, a ministry of counseling and also consulting with churches about some of the items like shame and sexuality, pastoral care, counseling, those kinds of things, uh, working with churches to, to try to develop those kinds of ministries in those contexts. They have five uh, children, four of those children are adopted. You'll see uh, that beautiful family uh, behind me. Uh, it's a delight for us to have Jason. Uh, I, did men I didn't mention also that uh, early on in his ministry career, he was at Bethlehem Baptist in Minneapolis working uh, underneath uh, John Piper. And um, maybe he wants to tell you a little bit of his story, but he, th he thought God was calling him to church planting and through some ways that only God can do, redirected him into a counseling ministry, but he has hopes and dreams one day of also uh, planting a church. Uh, Jason, would you come and share with us what God has put on your heart as it relates to community for us this morning? Thanks, brother. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Oh, it is wonderful to be with you guys this morning. Uh, as Mike mentioned, my wife and I spent five years in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's where we started our family, uh, where we first adopted our, our oldest two, and, uh, and then we, we adopted, and then we got pregnant. You can guess which one of our kids is uh, biological there. Uh, she kind of hidden there, kind of squished in the middle. She's right in the middle, um, and she, she's, uh, she does well. Uh, but so we see us, we spent five years in Charlotte, so coming back to the South is a special thing for me, uh, brings back lots of wonderful memories. Uh, we ended up in Austin, Texas for the last nine years where I was serving as a pastor of counseling and care, and, uh, and like Mike mentioned, that wasn't my, my plan 15, 20 years ago. I didn't, I didn't go to seminary thinking I was going to do counseling or be, be a pastor of counseling, so uh, so I, I speak to you, I share that because I speak to you as someone who, uh, who, who is, has learned a lot of what I'm going to share with you uh, b b by God's grace, and I'm still learning. Uh, I, 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 you know, maybe some of my personality lends itself towards uh, counseling and pastoral care, but a lot of uh, the issues of pastoral care... Uh, I, I've had to learn and God's had to teach me. And so it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge for the church to, to love one another, to know one another, to pursue one another. Counsel, a lot of pastors kind of uh, shy away from counseling because of how hard it is. And, uh, and so what I want to do today is to encourage you that uh, God has called us to be a, a church and a community that really loves one another and cares for one another. That counseling doesn't have to be a scary thing. Caring for one another, knowing one another, doesn't have to be uh, something that, that only the professionals do. Uh, but it's something that it's, it's for all of us. So the question your, your leadership has been exploring in this lecture series is, how is that very question? How does the church become a place where everyone is loved and feels like they're truly known and belong? And it, it, that's the question we're all asking. How, how can I be loved and known and belong? Uh, a place where the broken feel safe and, and can be honest and where the hurting feel at home. Uh, and that's what we all want and long for. Uh, you know, and it's the question that gets at the heart of what true biblical community looks like uh, and, and how we can experience it. it. It's a question that churches have been asking for, from the beginning of time. And church, it's, it's also a question and an issue that churches have been struggling with, I think, since the beginning of the church. 
Uh, like I said, I'm still trying to figure this out. It's, it's not an easy thing. There's not, I, I'm not here this morning to offer you three steps on how to, how to become this kind of wonderful, loving, biblical community. It, it, for, in God's infinite wisdom, it, it's harder than that. Uh, there's some, there's, it's simple, but it's also very hard and, and challenging. And so I want to, but I want to encourage you. I'm, I'm someone who, who, despite the brokenness and the messiness that we all are familiar with when it comes to, to knowing one another, loving one another, breaking through the shame and the guilt and, and the sin and all of that, despite all that, I have great hope for what God is doing in his church. I have great hope for, for what God is doing here. Just in the time that I've been able to spend with your leaders and, and folks, it is so encouraging. And so throughout this lecture series, you've been discussion, discussing these issues of shame and sexuality and, and how those impact your lives as a community and, and individually. And so I want to encourage you to continue in this journey uh, and to begin to put into practice what you've learned and heard. I want to share a little bit of a vision for what this could look like for you guys uh, in the days ahead and challenge you to live into that, villi- into that vision to become the kind of gospel-centered community that we all long for, a place where we're known, loved, and belong. Uh, so it's pretty simple. I, I just wanna, I wanna, my prayer is that you would take what you've learned and put it into practice. And, uh, and so let, let me do this. Let me start by praying because we need God's help. Uh, let, let me pray. Father, I just ask, I thank you for these saints. I thank you for this, this body. And I pray this morning you would enlarge our hearts, enlarge our imaginations for who you are, for what you've done, and for what you're doing and what's possible in this community by your spirit. Do that today, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So what I want to do is I want to start briefly at the beginning and if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis. So we're going to start right at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3. And what we see here in Genesis is, is the first, I call this the first eternal community. Uh, I don't think your church has small groups necessarily. You have Sunday school groups. You know, the Trinity, you could think of as the first small group that ever existed uh, in the church. And, and it existed for, for eternity. So we, we, we see the triune God living forever, eternally, in, in love and delight in one another, in, in, in true community. And I think that's important for us to, to begin there. Uh, because here's the thing, we're made in the image of the Trinity, aren't we? So we're made in his image to reflect the very heart and the very nature of God. And so as we look at who God is and, and, and his nature, we see that, well, at the very heart of who he is, he's, a com- he's community. He's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, living and delighting in one another. Now, I know, it, it, at least for me, it's hard, for my, for, to, hard to wrap my mind around, around that and understand that fully, but I think it's, it's worth trying uh, because this, it's that very relationship that the Trinity has with one another, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, that God created us for and invites us into. It's, it, that's the relationship that God created us to reflect and to experience, and he's, he's re- invited us and saved us and redeemed us into that eternal community. Uh, there's nothing more amazing than that. And so it's important here for us to, to, to begin here and to remember because I think that it helps us understand brokenness better. It helps us understand kind of where we've fallen from and, and, and gives us categories for why community can be so hard. And, but, but yet why community can be so hard, but why it's something we just so deeply long for, Right? It's something we can't get around. We want to be known. We want to be loved. We want to belong. But yet, so often, and sadly, it's, it's, it's the community, it's, it's the relationships in our lives that create the deepest hurt. The relationships in our lives, especially in the church, are, are the relationships that are supposed to bring the greatest hope, the greatest sense of love and, and belonging. But sometimes they, they do the very opposite, right? But... But it's hard for us to give up on this because this, and the reason is, this is what we've been made for. This is what we've been created for and, and redeemed back into. 
Uh, so this explains the, the, the desires and the longings of our hearts as well as the brokenness that pervades our lives. Uh, so so let, let me remind us of what happened in the fall. And I want us to look at particularly at how God responded. Uh, so Adam and Eve, we see in Genesis chapter 3, they turned their backs on the love of God. Adam and Eve shared in this perfect relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and uh, decided that they knew better than God and wanted to be gods themselves. You know, you think of it this way, this is the worst sin ever committed, right? And, and we can say a lot about the dynamics of shame involved, and, uh, and, and I believe Kurt touched on this. If you've not read uh, his book, The Soul of Shame or Anatomy of the Soul, uh, I know especially in Anatomy of the Soul, he has a chapter on the fall that is, that is worth the price of the book. So I'm not going to go into that, but what I want us to do is look here at God's response to Adam and Eve's sin. And so I'm going to read Genesis 3, chapter, Genesis chapter 3, 6, verses 6 through 12, because we see here how God responds. It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man said to his wife, and the man and, the, and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So there is so much here. Uh, you know, not, not to mention the fact that, that Adam and Eve, you know, one hid, and tried to hide from God. We can say a lot about that, the foolishness of that. But, but then look at the, when God calls them out, what do they do? They blame each other. They blame, uh, they blame Satan. But, he, but look at God's response. It's just amazing. And, and, and if we even go further in Genesis in verse 15, we see that God provides a redeemer, a promise of a redeemer Genesis 3.15, and then Genesis 3.21, the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. And then Genesis 3.24, he drove the man out uh, at the east of the garden and he placed the cherubim in a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So here, here God, this, this is, we see God's response. So what does this mean? What, what, what do we see here? In response to the worst sin ever, the purest experience of shame and hiding and blame shifting and covering up, which, which, is, a, which is really amazing because that's what we do, don't we? That's, we're not alone. All of our efforts at blame shifting and hiding and shame goes right back to, to Adam and Eve and, and their, their first response to sin. But, but what is God's response? He doesn't blow up. He doesn't yell. He doesn't get angry. He isn't, he isn't disappointed that we can see or frustrated. What we see is that God moves towards Adam and Eve with profound compassion and tenderness and provision and restoration. It's amazing to me that, that the first thing God says is not a statement of, you blew it. It's a question. Where are you? Where are you? Now, in God's mind, and, and, and I don't know how Adam and Eve heard that, but, but what a beautiful question to ask. It's a question I often ask when I, when I meet with people in counseling. I, I'll ask them a, a, a version of that. Sometimes that very question, I'll say, where are you? I want to know where you are. Where's your heart? Where's, where's your mind? Where's your imagination? Where are you? I'm coming, I, I, I'm here for you. And, that, and that's, that's what God is saying to them. And, and, then, and then the provision that we see, the promise in, three, in Genesis 3.15 of the Redeemer of Jesus, who's going to make all things right. And then God covers them with, with skins. And then God protects them 
from, from going back to eat of the tree of life so that they wouldn't live forever in, in sin. So God provides for them. God comes to them. And this is the gospel in the most beautiful of ways as we see right here in Genesis 3. And this always reminds me of two other verses in, Gen- in the New Testament. Galatians 6.1 says this, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. And don't, isn't that what we see God doing? Restoring Adam and Eve with a spirit of gentleness. So here in the New Testament, we see it continued on, the reflection of God's heart here. Then Romans 2, 4 says this, do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that, listen to this, God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Sadly, oftentimes, the way we lead one another or even ourselves to repentance is not with kindness or tenderness. In in my experience, and, and, and I'm guilty of this, I, I, I've, I've tried to get, I, I see this especially with my kids. My, my children are, are, are such a gift and a, of grace and, and means of grace, oftentimes of exposing my sin, which, which is in God's kindness a, a means to lead me to repentance, right? But, but so often my way of responding to my kids and wanting them to repent is, is frustration, is exasperation. And, 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 and this, so this convicts me. This challenges me deeply. Uh, because this is God's heart. In well, the, the gospel, uh, in the New Testament, we see in Christ, this picture of God's love is, is made even more clear. It's, it's made 3D, 4K. You know, the new TVs, are just, you know, they keep just getting better and better. As clear as possible, possibly can be made. So we see in, in, in Christ... Coming to the cross, Jesus taking our sin and our shame and brokenness and giving us his righteousness and holiness. That he who knew no sin became sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21. This great exchange that happens in all of our lives. And so on the cross, the Father takes care of our sin once and for all time. So the, the, the Father's uh, anger and wrath and all the justice that, and punishment that our sin deserves, God pours out not on us, but he pours it out on Jesus. And he pours it all out, so there's none left. So you and I will never experience the wrath of God if we're in Christ, because Christ took that wrath, took that punishment for us. Every last drop he took so that we never have to experience it. I, I love what, what Tim Keller says about this and what God has done through Christ and the gospel. He says, the gospel of justifying faith means that while Christians are in themselves still sinful and sinning, yet in Christ, in God's sight, they are accepted and righteous. So we can say that we are more wicked than we ever dared believe, but more loved and accepted in Christ than we ever dared hope. At the very same time. It means that the more you see your own flaws and sins, the more precious, electrifying, and amazing God's grace appears to you. But on the other hand, the more aware you are of God's grace and acceptance in Christ, the more able you are to drop your denials and self-defenses and admit the true dimensions and character of your sin. That's the wonderful thing about the gospel, of, of the good news, that, that it, it breaks through our shame, breaks through our guilt, removes the defenses, removes the, the, the need to blame, the need to hide, the, need to, that, that we, the incessant need that we have to cover ourselves. Right? Like we all have our own ways of covering ourselves. We come to church, in a sense, every week, oftentimes covered with, with our own versions of the fig leaves, Right? Often forgetting that we're already covered in the blood of Christ, in the righteousness of Jesus. And because of that, we can be absolutely honest about our need for grace, our remaining need, and our remaining struggle with sin. It's, 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 it's wonderful. It's, it's also really hard. Uh, the reality is because the gospel we're loved and known intimately and ultimate, ultimately by the one who matters most, we don't have to fear how God sees us. He took care of all of our sin and guilt and shame on the cross. 
Uh, he knows us. He exposes us. I think that's probably the, one of the hardest things is when God exposes us, uh, we, we face ourselves, we see ourselves, and, and, and we have to come to terms with the reality of, of our need. And that's, and that's hard, isn't it, if we're honest? That's hard for me to, to, to face the reality that I still need God, that I, that I cannot figure this out on my own. And so in Christ and in the gospel, we're humbled. We're humbled. And his kindness leads to repentance. And it changes us. It, 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 it stirs within us as we experience the, this love that leads us to, to see our need and to, to see God's provision. It, 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 it moves us to love God back in return. And we're loved. Uh, we, we love him as he first loved us. Um, and that's what we need. That's what we all need. And I think that's the heart of, if we want to be a gospel-centered community, if we want to, to become a place where we're loved and we're known and, and we belong, we've got to begin here. Every one of us has to experience first, and, and, and not just first, and then move on from this, but experience over and over and over every day, every hour, maybe even more than that, maybe every minute, the 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 realization that we need Christ, that we're clothed in Christ, that, that, that we are more needy than we'll ever, ever be able to understand. And that, that's, a, again, a hard thing to, to, to come to terms with, but an f- incredibly freeing thing, because I think deep down we all know that that's the reality, don't we? We all know deep down that we are needy people. And, and so that's the, heart, that, that's the simple heart of what begins to create a gospel-centered community, a community that's based on our need for Christ, on the gospel, not based on, on being able to uh, you know, ask the right questions or, or figure out the right structure of how to meet together and, and the right dynamic. All those things can be valuable, but, but if we're going to really become a, a people and a church that, that loves one another, knows one another, we've got to become free of our own defenses, of our own covering and the only way we're going to do that is through Christ, it's through encounter, an encounter with the gospel, an encounter with Jesus that frees us. And so, so that, that's the good news. That's the good news. That, uh, that, that, that's how God responds to us. Even when, it, it, This is the amazing thing. Even when we hide, when we're paralyzed with fear and shame, God doesn't say, well, hey, here's what I want you to do. Come out of that and do this you know, do these three things. He said, he, he comes to us. He comes to us. And, 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 and so, so that's, that, that's the first point. The second point that I want to make and encourage us with is that God, God's design for us is to reflect his heart. So our, God's purpose in our lives and for his church is that we would be a people that reflect his response to sin and shame and brokenness. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, you look, I look at my own response again, and, and it's often not in line. And so we're, 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 this is something we're continually growing in, um, and, 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 and we need to continue to practice. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to f- sp- share a little bit of how we can do that, but I just want to say uh, a few things here about God's plan for his church and our, uh, his desire for us to reflect his heart. So when people are, are in sin, when people are stuck in shame, paralyzed in fear and you know, anxiety, depression, whatever it might be, every one of us is, is experiencing and facing a, a great battle, right? Uh, and so what do we do? How do we respond? Uh, I think that what we have here is, 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 our, is our, not just our model, because we see in Christ, we see in God, him moving, him coming, him, him taking the initiative. And that's what he wants for us. That's what we see, see him doing. Uh, but it, it, here, here's the wonderful thing, too, that, that uh, it's not just an example that we follow. Uh, one of the most wonderful doctrines is the doctrine of our union with Christ. And this gives us so much hope because what, what it, the doctrine of union with Christ means is whether we kind of like it or not, we're, we're in Christ and he is in us. And, and so 
everything I'm talking about here, this, the, our response and, and, and the call of the church to be this kind of community that loves one another and reflects God's heart and his response to sin by, by taking the initiative is, is not just another thing that we add on, onto our to-do list of things that, that, uh, that we need to you know, do to be good Christians. It, it, it is, but it, it's so much more than that. It's, it's, it's that we participate in in the very ministry that Jesus is, is doing today, right? Have you thought about this? That Jesus ascended to the Father but gave us the Spirit and in, by the, in, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is present everywhere. And Jesus is presently working. Jesus is presently here with us, which, which is amazing. And so Jesus, it's Jesus' ministry that we participate in. It's not our ministry that Jesus comes and joins and blesses. And th- th- this is what enables me to continue to do counseling day in and day out and to, to do pastoral care and to, con- and to have hope for the church because, because it's God's ministry, it's Jesus' ministry that he's doing that we get to join in with him in through our union with him. And, and, and so we don't have to be the ones to fix people. We don't have to be the ones to have all the answers for people because I think, isn't that oftentimes the fear? If, if we are hanging out with somebody from, from church, from Sunday school, uh, after, you know, maybe in the foyer or for coffee. And, and sometimes the fear is if I ask them how they're really doing, they might actually tell me. And then I'm going to have to say something back and maybe have some wisdom or, or I might have to help them. And, and I don't know what to do. Have you ever felt like that? Like ill-equipped? To, to, but here's the good news. When you're sitting with that person or, or over coffee in the foyer, it's not just you and them. Jesus is present. And Jesus loves them more than you do. Jesus know, has way more wisdom than you, way more wisdom than me. And Jesus is the only one who can help them and fix them and redeem them. And just like he's the only one who can redeem you and me. And, and that's good news. And, and in our union with him, we get to join him in that ministry. It's, I, I like to think of it as... Uh, like in union with Christ, we get to participate in the in the eternal community, the love of the Father and the Son, so that the, the, that that family relationship. But we also are, are get to participate in the family business, the family ministry. So Jesus calls says, I, "I'm I'm 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 going I'm going to do some ministry here. You get to join me in this." And that's, I think, the heart of community is that we, we participate in, in, how God, in what Christ is doing. And that gives us a lot of hope and, perse- and ability to persevere in it because it's not up to us. Does that make sense? It's not up to us to, okay, now just be a, be a gospel-centered community. Like a lot of times sometimes what we can leave each other with is like, here's the gospel, well, you know, and now just do better. Be a better Christian. Like be a better community in light of this. And, and it, it, and it's more than that. This is who you are. This is who you've been created to be. This, this, this Christ is in you and you're in Christ. And so wherever Christ goes, you go. And I love it. Like whether you, you kind of, you, whether you like it or not, you're being made into the image of Jesus. And so, so that's the hopeful thing. That's the hopeful thing for us is that in Christ, if we're faithful to Christ, if we're walking in Christ, you're going to become a gospel-centered community. Isn't that, the good, isn't that good news? And so just like Paul says, you are dead to sin. You've been raised with Christ. Now live in that light of that. You are in Christ. You're, you're a community. You are known. You are loved. Now live in light of who you are. Um, and so as, as we do that, I, I, I think that, that, that makes us humble people. It makes us repentant people. Uh, it makes us loving people. And, and, and if that's your aim, and I, and I know that's your heart, that's the heart of your leadership here, if that's your aim, then, then there is so much hope for this church to be a force of shame-breaking, culture-shaking love and hope here in Augusta. That, that, that this community continue to become transformed and, into a place that truly is a safe place to be known and loved and, 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 and to be broken and honest. Uh, but it's going to take breaking through uh, and it's going to take a lot of humility and repentance. So let me say a few things about that. Um, so th- th- this is my encouragement uh, going forward. Uh, it- it's fairly simple. One, just to be, and, I- and I've said a lot already about that, be who God made you to be. And, and-, and to be, is- it's not something you-, you 
that you can do. It's just you just you have to accept it, right? Like, okay, I'm in Christ and I am loved and I am known and I'm I'm accepted and I'm a part of a family. And there's, you know, like any family, there's some cousins or second cousins that you're like, I, I'd prefer kind of not to hang out with them. Uh, but we're stuck with them. and We're stuck with each other. And that's the, be- that's the messy and the beautiful thing. We hurt each other. But here's the thing. We hurt each other. And that gives us an opportunity to do what? But to forgive. And to, and to love. And, and, and that's the way God is, has designed it. That's, that, that's, that, that's how he, he's... he's what he's, his purpose is for us and his church. But, but here, that's the good news. It's, it's be the church. Be, be the church that is in Christ, that is growing in Christ, reflecting his heart. That's the first encouragement. The second is to do some things. So we don't get off too easy here. So there's some things that we can do, right? Uh, you know, Paul says, you've died to sin. Well, now put it to death, right? Well, but I've died to it. Why do I have to put it... What? It's both and. So be the church. Be this community. Well, and here's what we can do. Uh, pra- it takes practice. It takes practice uh, to be a, this, a spirit-filled, gospel-centered community. And it takes practice in humility, repentance, and love. So I just, in, in closing, want to say a few things about, about that. Uh, humility. Uh, is practice humbling yourselves before God. Ask for help from him and others. I know that's so simple, but, but when, think about this. When was the last time you, you asked for help from God? And when was the last time you asked for help from somebody else? To so practice that. To practice that today. It's something simple. Because here, here's, the, here's the reality. I, I love this verse in Hebrews. Hebrews 3, verses 12 and 13. The writer of the Hebrews says, Take care, brothers, and sisters, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. What I love about this verse is that the writer of the Hebrews and, and God's Spirit inspiring this knows how, how needy we are. Right? And, and, and we don't like to, I don't like to admit this. I, I I have experienced shame and guilt for, for, for when I felt like I need to ask for help. It's something I have to daily fight, uh, the temptation to just be self-dependent and, and, and self-sufficient. I, I can even put a gospel angle to it and say, well, I, if I'm a mature Christian, I'm a pastor, I'm a leader, like, I, I shouldn't need be as needy as I feel like I might be. But he, Hebrews says, no, you're so needy and so prone to wander that you need to take care of that. Every day you need somebody to encourage you and to exhort you. I love that. Not once a week, not on, just on Sunday, not on Wednesday, but every day we need somebody in our lives, outside of ourselves, to exhort us. And that's, how, that's how needy we are. That's how weak we are. That's how prone we are. And, I, and, and as I read that, it, 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 it's, it's so encouraging because I know deep down that that's true. And so... so Humble yourself before God. I, I love this. In, in Second Peter, he says this. Uh, you know, Second Peter, Peter's talking about like growing in maturity in the Christian life, and and then he says that uh, that that if if we forget that we've been cleansed from all of our sin, we we're being nearsighted and blind and forgetful, and we're all prone to that. We're all prone to forgetting that we've been cleansed from all sin and, 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 and we've, we're all prone to forgetting who we are, right? Like, like that, that's our, one of our biggest problems is we just forget what we have in Christ and who we are in Christ, right? Again, if we could remember that, if we could see ourselves the way Jesus sees us, the Father sees us, it would free us from the fear, uh, so much fear, so much shame, so much guilt, uh, and, but, but we forget. And so this is what Peter says. I love this. In 2 Peter verse, uh, ver- chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, he says, I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. I love that because that's, that's me. I need to be reminded. I need to, I need to be reminded of who I am in Christ, who God is, how he sees me, how free I am, what the inheritance I have, 
And, w- and when I experience that, when I'm reminded of that, it, it changes the way I, 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 I interact in, 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 my, in relationships. I don't have to, I, I'm less, less likely to hide. I'm less likely to cover up. I'm less like, I'm more, I'm less self-centered and self-dependent. I'm more others focused. And I think if, if, if we can do this, if you can do this, humble yourself. If we can humble ourselves and ask for help and, and receive the help we need, the, rem- the reminders that we need, that, 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 that's, a, that's a critical step in becoming this gospel-centered community that we want to be. The second is, so the first is humility. The second is repentance. Practice repentance. Practice, this is good news, right? Practice repentance. And here's what I want you to remember. Remember, it's the kindness of the Lord that leads to repentance. And repentance is a gift from God. I, I think oftentimes in the church we think that the most mature Christians are measured by how little they repent. Right? You know what the, the reality is? It's, it's, it's the exact opposite. I think it, you read many of the biographies of the great men and women of God throughout church history. You look at the Apostle Paul, and when he wrote the words, I am the chief of sinners, you know when he was writing that? It was at the end of his life. The older and the more mature we get in the faith, the more we see our sin, the more we're willing to see our sin and not, not be paralyzed by it and not be be overcome by it, but we see it, and then we see it as an opportunity to experience the kindness and the love and the grace of the gospel and of Christ. And so practice repentance. It's our turning from our self-reliance to dependence on God, not just once, but again and again and again. Uh, Martin Luther, uh, in his first of, of his 95 theses for the Christian life, says this, all of life is repentance. All of life is repentance. It's, it, repentance and confession brings to light what God already knows. God already knows. God already sees every sin, every bit of brokenness in our life, and he's already taken care of it on the cross. He already knows. And so it's, it's, this, it's repentance that enables us to be known by others and invites others to share their hearts and needs as well. I, I, I've seen this um, not as much as I'd like, but, um, but it... When people repent, what, what, what do we often feel? I, I, whenever somebody repents, I, f- I feel more respect and more admiration for them, and I, and I feel more free to repent myself, to turn from my self-reliance. And so you look at the history of the church, and every revival was started by people humbling themselves and, and being humbled in light of God's glory and repenting. I'm repenting, and oftentimes it was the leaders doing this publicly and, and modeling that for others. So I, I want to say every one of you in this room can be a leader, can, can model repentance, and, and, and that's going to be a key to becoming uh, the, gospel, the kind of gospel-centered community that, 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 that enables us to take off our masks and take off the, the, the coverings of ourselves and, and glory in and, and revel in and experience the covering of Christ. But it, it's got to begin with humility and repentance. Um, but, it, but again, what, what a wonderful gift that that is. And then lastly, love. Uh, reach out to others. Love, just simply. Like, and, and here's the most powerful way we can love and we can practice this. Give your, give your time to people. You know, the, when I was in Austin, we started a counseling center. And, uh, and the counseling center grew really fast. We, we, we ended up having 30 counselors on our staff professional counselors in five locations around the city, and we were seeing over a 1,000 session clients a, a, week, a month. And, but one of the things we learned from that, I learned a lot of things. One of the things I learned was people were willing to pay to see a counselor, not often, a lot of times for, for special things, specialized needs and working through, through intense issues, but a lot of times we had a lot of people coming in because they just wanted someone to listen to them. They were willing to pay good money to have an undistracted hour of somebody saying, tell me your story. How are you feeling? How was your week? It's, it, it, it's as simple as, as that and profound as that and, and life, as life-changing as that. I've, I've seen it over and over and over again. And you know, the, the sad thing is that we can do that, but it's so rare. It's so rare. When was the last time you had an undistracted hour or two with somebody where, you, where, where they truly listen to you 
or you practice that with them. You truly listen. You say, tell me your story. And, and here's how you can simply do this. We, we often stay around and talk about just the facts. Well, move from the facts to, to feelings. It can be as simple as, how are you feeling about that? Tell me more about that. How are you doing and really meaning it? It could be as simple as just saying, tell me your story. I, I've known you for a while, but tell me your story. How did you meet your wife? How did you meet your spouse? How, how did you end up moving to Augusta? Tell me more about your story. Tell me about your kids. That'll open up all kinds of doors. And I tell you, it's one of the mo- most profound ways of loving one another and practicing this. David Augsburger said, being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they are almost indistinguishable. Almost indistinguishable. So, humility, practice humility, practice repentance, practice love, and, and, don't, and, and, and do that remembering your union with Christ, that Christ is the only one who perfectly loves and, 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 and was perfectly humble before the Father, and, 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 and Jesus in our place took our sin and our shame so that we're covered, we're covered if you do that, I, I have so much hope for you guys, and for this church, and what God is doing now, and what Jesus is going to do in the days to come. Let me end with this. The writer of the Hebrews says, Now may the, Lord, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much.